Section 7.5, Quantitative Chemical Analysis. In this section, you're going to learn about three lab techniques and how we will analyze them with stoichiometry, titration, gravimetric analysis, and combustion analysis. Let's start with titration. Titration analysis involves using the concentration of one reactant and the stoichiometry to find the concentration of the other reactant. So we'll be doing this in lab in our determination of acetic acid lab. A few de definitions I want to analyze here. First is titrant is the substance of known concentration. It is typically put in the burette, which is this long, tall piece of glassware right here. Second is our analyte. It's our substance of unknown concentration, which is typically placed in the beaker down below. Equivalence point is the point in the reaction when moles of titrant equals moles of analyte. Or for acid-base reactions, it's where moles of H plus equals moles of OH minus. So it's kind of like the halfway point. The indicator is the substance which changes color at or near the equivalence point, um, but more specifically, the end point is the point at which the indicator changes color. So in our experiment in lab, we're going to use an indicator called phenolphthalein that changes from being clear to being pink when the reaction changes from being acidic to being basic. So let's just go ahead and look at a titration example. This problem states the end point in a titration of a 50 milliliter sample of aqueous hydrochloric acid was reacted by addition of 35.23 milliliters of 0 0.250 molar NaOH titrant. The reaction is this, HCl plus NaOH forms NaCl and H2O. So this is a neutralization reaction. So essentially what's happening in the lab here is you've got a 50 milliliter sample of aqueous HCl. And so that's in the glass beaker, that would be in the glass beaker down below here. Then you've got NaOH in the tube and you're adding NaOH until you notice the indicator changes color and that's when the reaction is complete. So you got a 50 milliliter sample of aqueous HCl. You know your concentration of NaOH and you now know how much uh, NaOH you had to add. So what you can do here is you can use the volume of NaOH and the molar concentration to find moles NaOH. Once you find moles NaOH, you're gonna use stoichiometry to find moles HCl. And final step, you'll use moles HCl and the volume of that sample to determine the concentration or the molarity of the HCl. All right, so let's walk through these steps. First, I'm gonna convert that volume of NaOH to liters, since when anytime you use the molarity equation, you've gotta use the volume in liters. So that would be 0 0.03523 liters NaOH. Next, I'm gonna find moles NaOH. So I'm gonna take that concentration molarity, 0 0.250 molar, and multiply by the volume in liters. So that tells me I added 0.0088075 moles NaOH to my beaker. Now I'm going to use stoichiometry. So I'm going to convert from moles NaOH to moles HCl using these coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. Okay, it's a one to one ratio, so it's the same number. Now final step is I'm going to convert that volume to liters. So that was 50, a 50 milliliter sample of HCl. And now I've got moles HCl, I've got the volume of HCl in liters, so I can find the molarity. So 0 0.0088075 moles HCl divided by 0 0.05000 liters HCl. And this gives me a concentration of 0 0.176 molar HCl. So that's really all there is to it, to these titration analysis examples. Really, there's just one extra step in the beginning and one extra step at the end. You need to use the molarity equation to find moles and AOH. Then it's just the stoichiometry problem to find moles of HCl. And then finally, again, you just use that molarity equation to find the molar concentration of HCl. All right, quick knowledge check question. Automobile batteries use three molar sulfuric acid, H2SO4, as an electrolyte. How much 1.20 molar NaOH will be needed to neutralize 225 milliliters of battery acid? So here you've got the concentration of H2SO4 and the volume of H2SO4, and you need to find the volume of 1.20 molar NaOH required. So it's the same general setup here, just the steps are slightly different. All right, correct answer is C, 1.1 liters. So first thing you should do, convert this to liters, then use volume H2SO4 and molarity H2SO4 to find moles H2SO4. Once you have found moles H2SO4, use stoichiometry to find moles NaOH. And final step, use moles NaOH and the concentration to solve for the volume. And you should get C, 1.1 liters. 
All right, let's move on to our second type of problem. This is gravimetric analysis. In gravimetric analysis, a physical or chemical change allows separation of one component of a sample. Once separated, mass measurements and stoichiometry can be used to find the concentration of that component. So we're imagining, uh, let's just go ahead and get into the example so I can tell you what I'm talking about here. So in this problem, we've got a 0 .0, 0 0.4550 gram solid mixture that contains magnesium sulfate. So we've got a solid mixture. We know this solid mixture has magnesium sulfate in it, but it's got some other stuff in it too. We don't know how much magnesium sulfate is in that mixture. So our goal is to figure out the mass percent of the magnesium sulfate in that original mixture. So what we do is we take that solid mixture, we dissolve it in water, and then we treat it with an excess of barium nitrate. So after it's treated with an excess of barium nitrate, this results in the precipitation of 0.6168 grams barium sulfate. So the goal here is to find the mass percent of magnesium sulfate in the mixture. So let's think about this. We want to find the mass percent of MgSO4. So we know what the mass of the solid mixture is. So that means our goal here is to figure out, well, how many grams of MgSO4 are in that mixture. So the goal here is to find mass MgSO4. So how do we go from grams barium sulfate to grams magnesium sulfate? Well, this is a matter, again, of this is really just a stoichiometry problem dressed up in some more complicated verbiage. So we're going to take the mass of BaSO4 and we're going to convert that to moles BaSO4 using the molar mass. Once we found moles BaSO4, we can convert from moles BaSO4 to moles MgSO4 using those coefficients as a conversion factor. Then using the molar mass of MgSO4, we can find mass MgSO4. And then final step is to use the mass of MgSO4 and that sample mass to find the percent or the mass percent of MgSO4 in that mixture. So let's walk through those steps. We've got 0 0.6168 grams of barium sulfate. We're going to convert that to moles using its molar mass. We get 0 0.002642 moles barium sulfate. Then I'm going to convert to moles magnesium sulfate using the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. It's a one to one ratio, so it's the same number. Now I'm going to convert from moles magnesium sulfate to grams using the molar mass. And so I get 0 0.3181 grams magnesium sulfate. And final step again is my goal was to find the percent by mass. So 0 0.3181 grams magnesium sulfate divided by 0 0.4550 grams multiplied by 100% to put in a percentage and I get 69.91%. That is my final answer here. Again, this is really just a stoichiometry problem just dressed up with in a more complicated word problem. So just take your time and practice these. Practice on deciphering these because really it's just a matter of some critical thinking to analyze the word problem and figure out how to plug these numbers in properly. The math itself is not challenging. What is challenging is just practicing this and making sure you understand how to fit everything in correctly to find the final answer. All right, quick knowledge check question for you. What is the percent of chloride ion in a sample of one point, oh, excuse me, if 1.1324 grams of the sample produces 1.0881 grams of AgCl when treated with excess Ag plus? Okay, and the correct answer here is 23.77%. All right, so we've got 1.00881 grams of AgCl. So what you need to think about here is the reaction that's happening is it's Ag plus, which is excess, plus Cl minus, we don't know how much there is, forms AgCl. Now we know we have 1.0881 grams of this. So you need to use stoichiometry to convert from grams AgCl to grams Cl minus. Once you do that, you take that grams Cl minus and you divide by the original mass of the sample and then convert it to a percentage and you get a 23.77%. All right, last part of this section, last type of analysis is combustion analysis. So here we're gonna take a hydrocarbon and we're gonna react that hydrocarbon with oxygen gas to produce CO2 and H2O. 
So the point here is that this hydrocarbon, we don't know what its formula is. So we're gonna determine how much CO2 and H2O are produced. So the products, CO2 and H2O, are usually trapped by absorbers. So they're trapped by absorbers, and then the calculations here are based on the law of conservation of mass. So let's break down the problem here. So what you're gonna be given, you've got an unknown hydrocarbon, it's being reacted with excess oxygen gas, and it's producing carbon dioxide and water. So in these types of problems, you'll be given the initial mass of the hydrocarbon, and you'll be told how much CO2 and H2O are produced. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna to wanna to start with grams CO2, and you're gonna to wanna to convert it to moles CO2, then convert to moles carbon, and finally convert to grams carbon. Then, with that mass of H2O, convert from grams H2O to moles H2O, then to moles of hydrogen, and finally to grams of hydrogen. You're going to want to add these two things together. You're going to want to add these two things together, and you're going to want to figure out if there's any excess mass. Because if you look at the chemical reaction here, all of the carbon in carbon dioxide must have come from the hydrocarbon. Similarly, all of the hydrogen in water must have come from the hydrocarbon. It couldn't have come from anywhere else. So whatever mass of carbon is produced in the CO2, that must be how many grams of carbon are in that hydrocarbon. Similarly, however many grams of hydrogen are recovered at the end, that must be how many grams of hydrogen were in the hydrocarbon. Final thing you're gonna to wanna to do here is you're gonna to wanna to sum these together and just to see there could be oxygen. There may or may not be oxygen in your hydrocarbon. So you're gonna to wanna to sum these two masses together and see if there is a difference. So you're gonna take that initial mass, subtract it from these two, and that will tell you if there is any oxygen in your hydrocarbon. Then from there, it's just simply a matter of finding the empirical formula, just following the steps we outlined in chapter six. All right, now let me show you an example problem. This problem states, polyethylene is a hydrocarbon polymer used to produce food storage bags and many other flexible plastic items. A combustion analysis of a 1.2604 gram sample of polyethylene yields 3.9545 grams of CO2 and 1.6188 grams of water. What is the empirical formula of polyethylene? All right, so I'm gonna start with my carbon dioxide and I'm gonna convert that to moles. Then I'm gonna convert from moles carbon dioxide to moles carbon. So it's just a one to one ratio since the subscript of carbon in CO2 is one. And finally, I'm gonna convert this to grams carbon. So this tells me that this, this reaction produced 1.0793 grams of carbon. Now let's do this with water. So 1.6188 grams of water, convert that from grams to moles. Then convert from moles water to moles hydrogen. Now be careful, there are two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of water since the subscript is two. And final step, convert from moles hydrogen to grams hydrogen. And this tells me that my reaction produced 0 0.18110 grams of hydrogen. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sum these together. So if you sum these two masses together, you find that these two masses sum to 1.2604. So this plus this gives 1.2604. So that means my hydrocarbon only has carbon and hydrogen in it. It does not have any oxygen in it. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to convert these two moles. Now this is just an empirical formula question. So convert from grams carbon back to moles carbon. This gives me 0 0.089859 moles carbon and convert from grams hydrogen to moles hydrogen. So this gives 0 0.17966 moles hydrogen. So I'm gonna go ahead and convert these and I find my empirical formula. So my final answer here is CH2. So just to recap this problem, how you do this problem, take these masses, take, take grams CO2, take grams H2O and convert them to grams carbon and grams hydrogen. Then you want to sum these masses together and compare that sum to the original mass of the sample. If these two sum to the original mass of the sample, that means there is no oxygen in the hydrocarbon. If there is a mass difference, then whatever that mass difference is tells you how many grams of oxygen there were in your hydrocarbon. And then finally, just take those masses and convert them to moles. 
and now you are just doing an empirical formula question. So I would just ask you to determine the empirical formula of the hydrocarbon. So the final answer here is CH2. Okay, let's go ahead and have you try this knowledge check question. What is the molecular formula for a compound having a molar mass of 90.04 grams per mole that contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? Now, combustion analysis here reveals 0.501 grams of CO2 and 0 .1, uh, 0.103 grams of water from burning 0.514 grams of the compound. So pause the video and give this problem a try. Okay, and the correct answer here is C, C2H2O4, C2H2O4. So this problem had one little extra step on the end. So when you went through the empirical formula, and when you, or when you went through the steps here and you found the empirical formula, you probably found an empirical formula of CHO2, so answer A. But now the final twist of this problem, I'm asking you for the molecular formula, so this problem or this compound right here has an empirical formula mass of 45 grams per mole so using the molar mass we multiply by that ratio of 2 to get our answer C the correct answer here is C C2H2O4 okay here are three practice problems for you to try so again pause the video give these problems a try make sure you understand the material in this section and once you have done so here are the answers to those problems. That concludes chapter seven. So that was a long chapter. It involved a lot of math. I was not always able to go over the problems just because I didn't quite have the space in the PowerPoint. So if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, come see me after lab. Come talk to me during my office hours. I'm happy to help you out if you are struggling with anything and make sure you, know, you go through the PowerPoint slides yourself. Rewatch these lecture videos if needed and practice those homework problems and those extra worksheets on Blackboard. So that concludes chapter seven. I'll see you in the next videos for chapters eight and nine, gases and thermodynamics.